The ancient Egyptian civilization lasted for over 3,000 years and became one of the most powerful and iconic civilizations in history. At its height, ancient Egypt's empire stretched as far north as modern-day Syria and as far south as today's Sudan. But long before it was an empire, ancient Egypt was a series of small, independent city-states that bloomed along North Africa's Nile River. The city-states were divided into two regions and named according to the flow of the Nile. Upper Egypt in the south, which was upstream, and Lower Egypt in the north, which was downstream. By about 3100 BC, the two halves united, thereby creating one Egyptian state that lasted for millennia. The reign of this civilization can be divided into three major periods of prosperity, called the Old, Middle, and New Kingdoms, and two periods of instability in between, called the First and Second Intermediate Periods. Guiding the Egyptian people was a succession of about 300 rulers, often referred to as pharaohs. Pharaoh, which means great house in Egyptian, was never the ruler's formal title. It only became synonymous with the ruling individual in modern times, thanks to its use in the Hebrew Bible. These rulers, who were not always men, nor Egyptian, were considered protectors of the people and served as divine liaisons between humanity and the hundreds of gods they worshipped. After the rulers passed away, ancient Egyptians believed they then became gods. To prepare their journey into the afterlife, the rulers constructed elaborate tombs, including the Great Pyramids at Giza and underground mausoleums in the Valley of the Kings. Rulers filled their tombs with all the items they could need in the afterlife, including gold, jewelry, food, drink, and even pets. Preparing for this journey to the gods also involved mummifying one's body. The deceased's corpse was embalmed, wrapped in hundreds of yards of linen, and placed inside the tomb so the body could be reanimated in the afterlife. To this day, structures like the Great Pyramids are a testament to the role of religion in ancient Egyptians' lives. But they also represent the innovative and cultural might of the Egyptian people. Innovations in mathematics and written language in particular propelled their civilization to success. Math, specifically measurement mathematics, helped Egyptians understand and harness their world with numbers like no other civilization had before. They developed a new form of measurement called the cubit. It was used to design massive structures, such as the Great Pyramid, with remarkable geometrical precision. The Egyptians also measured time. By combining mathematics with astronomy, they established a 24-hour division to the day and created a solar calendar, which was the first dating system in history to feature 365 days in one year. Lastly, Egyptians developed methods to measure and survey land around the Nile River. These civil engineering feats made way for the construction of dams, canals, and irrigation systems that helped farming and agriculture to flourish in the Nile Valley. In addition to mathematical concepts, the ancient Egyptians also created written languages to describe the world around them. The oldest and probably most well-known of these is hieroglyphic writing. This system was developed around 3150 BC during the Old Kingdom and has over 700 pictorial characters. It was used to inscribe monuments and pottery and predominantly served a decorative or ceremonial purpose. Soon after, another ancient form of writing, called hieratic, developed out of the hieroglyphic system. It was a form of cursive that was written in ink and served a more functional purpose. Unlike its more formal predecessor, hieratic was written on another ancient Egyptian innovation, papyrus. Papyrus was a type of paper derived from the papyrus plant, which grew plentifully along the Nile River. This medium gave the ancient Egyptians a new avenue of communication and record-keeping 
that allowed their civilization's administrative skill to grow and their culture to spread for thousands of years. As with all great empires, ancient Egypt came to an end. It was eventually conquered after a series of invasions, including those by the Persian Empire in the 4th century BC and the Roman Empire around 30 BC. Not many civilizations can claim a lifespan of over 3,000 years, let alone one that made vast cultural contributions that still resonate in modern times. Ancient Egypt, with its linguistic and mathematical innovations, spirituality and religion, and extensive political and military might, set a high standard for all civilizations that followed. A little short little video from National Geographic on, of course, the background of ancient Egypt, which, of course, I'll be talking about this week and also part of next week uh, as well. So anyway, Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. I'll be back, of course, uh, to my history 1113. Uh, of course, this is the first seven weeks class for the fall semester 2021. So I hope you're having a great, uh, you know, beginning of the semester. I guess we're going into week two. Uh, so it's like we do have some students watching right now uh, in the live broadcast. Uh, Aisha, hey, if you're having a great uh, afternoon. Lashanta is also watching uh, right now. Uh, Cartesia, hey, what's going on? If you're having a great time uh, out there. Uh, Devaney, uh, looks like we got Richard watching also. Good afternoon. Uh, Candy, Candace, hey, what's going on? We're having a great time out there. Uh, Fernando is also, uh, looks like he's in StreamYard. Uh, also, Aisha is in StreamYard too, I guess, uh, also as well. So anyway, um, I guess before we get started today, I'll kind of first talk about announcements like I you know, usually do uh, in the week. Uh, I think y'all have got, um, I think I've got two, two quizzes up right now uh, that y'all have, I know, to work on. Uh, of course, I know the prehistory one, uh, that's going to expire this week. Uh, I believe I'm going to give you like an extra day on it or whatever. I think you might have seen that. Uh, it should be due tomorrow on Thursday, uh, which is August 26. So now it's something you got to wrap up. Uh, but uh, next, I think it's next week, we've got the second um, you know quiz, which is out, which is ancient Mesopotamia, because uh, I think previously last last lecture, of course, I wrapped up. Uh, that part two lecture on uh, Mesopotamia. So I believe that's going to be due Monday next week or sometime around. They might extend that too a little bit like I sometimes do. But uh, and then, of course, vocab. Don't forget, like this coming Monday, or starting next week, uh, you've got the uh, first vocab due. So uh, that needs to be uh, posted, of course, to the assignment in Canvas uh, for me to, of course, grade those. So start Monday. Or if you want to post it earlier, you can also start doing it by the weekend uh, as well. So I can start, of course, grading it. Uh, so anyway, um, um, yeah, uh, if you have any, of course, comments, you know, questions about this lecture or, you know, previous, you know, comments later, you, know, you can, of course, leave me any kind of thing later, of course, on my YouTube channel. Don't forget about that. Because uh, I've been getting you know, a lot of comments, questions off and on uh, about various things about some of the lectures we had before. So if you got any kind of question about something about that, or uh, if you've got a question about the class, you know, you could email me about that uh, also uh, as well. Uh, here's the link, of course, to, uh, if you want to join me in StreamYard.com, uh, there's also the link, of course, to the, um, you go, of course, on there, you can see on my YouTube channel, the uh, playlist, of course, for this lecture series uh, on History 1113. So uh, anyway, in today's lecture, I'm going to, of course, mostly talk about the background of Egypt. I'm going to kind of talk first a little bit about the Nile River, which is you know kind of important to, you know, the basis of you know history of you know ancient Egypt a long time ago. Of course, still important in modern Egypt today. You can see the Sphinx behind me, and you can see some of the pyramids behind me too, like the Pyramid of Khafre. Uh, of course, it's over my left shoulder, and I think over the right shoulder. I think that's the Great Pyramid of Giza, uh, built by King Khufu. But um, anyway, uh, I will go into some of the also, you know, his, early history of, I'll get to like how Egypt unified today. Uh, and we'll even talk about some culture of Egypt. Like I'll get into like 
I'll probably talk a little about the gods of Egypt, like some of the famous gods that are kind of well known to Egypt. And I'll probably wrap it up talking about also the uh, mollification, which you know something that the Egyptians were known for in ancient times. So anyway, um, I want to first, of course, talk about today. We had talked about this previously before. We, we were talking about the four, you know, four river valley civilizations. I did tell you, of course, that Egypt was the youngest of the four originally. Uh, we had talked how, you know, I think we had what Mesopotamia or, or where Iraq is was the oldest, followed by India, uh, then China, and then of course you've got Egypt, uh, which usually dates about three to four thousand BC when Egypt, you know, gets started as a civilization. Of course, based in North Africa, uh, usually a lot of people talk more about Egypt than some of the other cultures. Uh, that the early ones anyway, because uh, they're so close to the West, you know, and I guess that culture in Mesopotamia, the biggest impact, you know, uh, on the West in general. But uh, Egypt's located uh, the northeastern part of Africa. It's kind of like situated between the Mediterranean Sea, of course, and the Red Sea, of course, based in the famous, you know, Nile River Valley uh, that everybody, of course, has heard of. Uh, of course, if you look at a map uh, of Egypt, uh, which you can see uh, right here in this particular map, um, it looks like we've got one more person joining us too, which is Jennifer. Hey, good afternoon. We're having a great time uh, out there. Uh, but um, yeah, the Egyptians themselves, you know, they peak in the Bronze Age uh, in about 3,000, about 12,000 BC. That's when most of the major kingdoms of Egypt work. Like we talk about the old, middle, new kingdoms, uh, that time period. And obviously geography plays a lot of, you know, major role in, uh, you know, Egypt a long time ago. You know, if you know about Egypt, it's, I think, about 90% desert. Uh, and of course, you got the area where the Nile River is, uh, which is the most fertile areas of Egypt. So the eastern part of Egypt is mostly more greener, but the western part of Egypt is in the central part of it, it's primarily desert. Uh, and um, there's a famous um, historian that we've talked about before, which, you know, Herodotus, the so-called father of Egypt, uh, he's the one that said it best that Egypt was the gift of the Nile. Uh, the fact that uh, without, you know, without the, you know, the river, uh, the civilization of Egypt, you know, would not have existed. And, um, I think we've talked about Herodotus a little bit before a few times. I know uh, Herodotus was, was really supposedly traveled to Egypt, they say, uh, and visited you know, the pyramids and things like that uh, that existed back then. And so in book two, his you know, histories that he's known for, he did kind of paint us a picture of you know the, you know, the culture of Egypt. Uh, he had his own ideas you know, about how they built the pyramids and things like that. We'll, we'll kind of talk about which... Some of that's been kind of disproven. Some of the things that he he kind of first talked about about Egypt a long time ago. Uh, but you can see the Nile right there, of course, in that picture. You can see how dramatic it is too, like some of the desert areas and the fertile areas that are kind of along the riverbank. And most of their agriculture is done kind of around where the Nile River Basin is, of course, today. Uh, a little bit about the Egyptians, by the way. The Egyptians were considered, like, I know they talk about their different, you know, culture or whatever, or, or ethnic, ethnicity or whatever, but they're kind of a mix of peoples. Uh, they're kind of like this uh, multi-ethnic empire. I think they refer to it as Afro-Asiatic is usually the term that they refer to uh, the Egyptians. And so they're kind of a mix of peoples. You know, you've got African peoples, obviously. you got people that are Semitic. Um, you got Libyans, uh, the Israelites. I think Syrians at one point uh, were all part of the Egyptian empire. Uh, they used to have a term, Hamitic, I think was the term they described, I think, closely to what they were. Uh, but um, I think I think if you have a people today that they're more closer to, uh, like in language-wise anyway, it's the Berber people that were in North Africa. Because Berber is very similar to the Egyptian language uh, that you have. Uh, the Nile, of course, going back to that, that map right there I was showing you, uh, the Nile, of course, is considered one of the most famous rivers in the world. Uh, it, of course, it's known for its unusual course. If you know about this, it starts from, you know, kind of like south to north, you know, flowing, flowing northward from 
Central Eastern Africa. So it's known for that. It's also known for its, you know, length. It is one of the longest rivers in the world. I think I think over 4,100 miles if you, you know, count all the tributaries that are added into it uh, also as well, which there's several tributaries that kind of run into it. Uh, if you look at this map, there's at least two major tributaries uh, that are part of the um, of the Nile system, uh, which the blue and the white Nile, those are considered to be the two main tributaries uh, that kind of flow and, I guess, form the main trunk of the Nile, which meets at Khartoum, which is in northern Sudan. Uh, but you can see how uh, the fact that uh, the Nile has other kinds of tributaries uh, as well, like the, the White Nile's got, uh, like you can see there down there, the, the Mountain Nile and the Victoria Nile, which they think is fed from Lake Victoria, which is kind of between uh, like Kenya and Tanzania down there. Uh, in Eastern Africa. Uh, so that's like one source. And then you got the, the Blue Nile's other source is uh, they think the uh, Ethiopian highlands. And there's a lake there. I don't know if you can see that lake there in the map, but it's Lake Tana. Uh, it's called just kind of like right here, Lake Tana is in Ethiopia. It's considered like one of the sources of, of the Blue Nile. So anyway, um, and I think majority of the water that goes down the Nile is from the Blue Nile, which a lot of the water, I think that's from the Blue Nile, is gotten mostly from monsoons. And then obviously the White Nile mostly comes from lakes like Lake Victoria. It's also the lake down there called Lake Albert. It's way down there uh, as well. So I think it's in close to Kenya and Congo. All right. Um, oh, also, if you look at that map there, too, uh, the Nile River is famous for its cataracts, these um, series of waterfalls or rapids that the river kind of goes down uh, as it flows down from the Sudan into Egypt. So it's obviously going downward uh, from like where the equator is and flowing down toward the Mediterranean, tea, Mediterranean Sea. So uh, Africa is like mostly a bunch of escarpments that's kind of flowing downward. Uh, towards the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and uh, the word cataract is a Greek word that means waterfall, uh, from the Greek word cataracta. Yeah, but there's six of them. I think I've got a map showing you the six uh, cataracts uh, that are along the Nile. It's kind of hard to see uh, in this map here, but there's six of them at one point. And you probably wonder why they're numbered this way. One, two, three, four, five five, six. Well, as the uh, British were exploring Egypt and the Sudan back in the 19th century, uh, they explored from north to south, uh, going up the river. Uh, so explorers, you know, had to actually, uh, you know, climb up the waterfalls uh, and all that. If you've heard maybe, uh, I think it's Dr. David Livingston, I think was one of the famous explorers, British explorers that went went up, up the river and into the Sudan uh, and all that. Uh, by the way, the word Nile is like, supposedly a Greek word, like from the word Nilus, Nilus or Nilus, you know, Nilus or Nilus, I guess, from the, either Greek or Latin, uh, which uh, the Egyptians, I think, called it Happy, H-A-P-Y, which Happy was also some uh, type of uh, Egyptian god that was one of the sons of Horus, uh, who supposedly controlled the river, uh, the flood of it and all that, or made it flood. And the word, uh, supposedly, it meant um, either river or great river, or some people say great canal, I think was maybe the translation of what it meant. I think it's just river, <laughs> what they called it. Uh, and, um, and so Nile kind of is the kind of a shortened name, which uh, I think of all from Greek, Arab, and Hebrew uh, variations uh, of that word. So Nile. Uh, also, you can see in this, uh, I've got this other picture here to show you. That here's the um, Nile Delta, which is massive uh, in size. So uh, the river obviously empties out into the Mediterranean Sea, a large size delta, uh, which the word delta, by the way, uh, comes from the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet, which is the delta, which looks like a triangle, hence the name uh, being used. Uh, and... Um, in ancient times, there were at least two main major branches of the delta that were important. There's one called Rosetta, and the other one's called Demeta. Uh, they had 
Well, and that's where they get the word Rosetta, the Rosetta Stone. You hear that term or the thing Rosetta Stone? You may have heard of that, which is famous later uh, from a town that's in the Delta where they found the Rosetta Stone. So hence the name being used, of course, later. You can see in that map, like I guess Google Earth or whatever it is, uh, how you know fertile the river is. You can see how green it is. So that's where they would you know grow mostly crops, ancient modern times. Uh, and uh, the Egyptians had a um, Egyptian name for Egypt, which was Kemet, uh, which meant in hieroglyphs, it meant the black land, uh, which had to do with this fertile mud or fertile silt, I guess, that would wash up uh, during, I guess, the, the flood season, and they would use it to grow crops. Uh, so they're talking about all the fertile land that's along the river, which if I'm not mistaken, something like about 1.2 million square miles that's actually fertile along the actual river in the Delta area. So, uh, And also there's an area called Fayum, which you can't see here, but Fayum is kind of located west uh, of the Nile, uh, which is an oasis area in Egypt. So all these areas are here where a lot of people live too. Uh, up, I think most people live kind of in Egypt around mostly the, the Nile River. Uh, even back then, of course, uh, like today. Uh, then you see all those areas that are kind of like in that tan color, which are, all, of course, all desert. Uh, the desert areas of Egypt were often called Deshret, uh, which meant red land, uh, the desert areas. It's also a name that they sometimes called the Delta area you're looking at, too, uh, in the northern part of Egypt. Because uh, a lot of the pharaohs, of at least early pharaohs of the northern part of Egypt, which is later called Lower Egypt, wore red crowns. Uh, and so they, they got the term red land also being used. But it was also a nickname for the areas that were desert. They were on both sides you know, of the river basin. And, yeah, that's the one thing about Egypt. If you go back to this uh, map showing you, I think it was one up here I had showing you Egypt. Uh, right here, um, the area that's uh, in the northern part of Egypt versus southern part of Egypt, uh, they have two separate areas geographically. Uh, the lower part of Egypt is often called what we call this is the upper. The upper part is called Lower Egypt, and then down here, like see where Cairo is up there, that's Lower Egypt, and then down here you have what they call Upper Egypt which is kind of confusing. I know uh, Lower Egypt is the northern part of Egypt and Upper Egypt is the southern part of Egypt, but it has to do with where the river is. So Lower Egypt is like the bottom of the river, like where the Delta is, Cairo. And then um, the upper part of Egypt is more of the upper part of the river basin, uh, where it kind of blows you know, from uh, Sudan into Egypt. It was kind of describing like the two different geographic locations of Egypt. Uh, there is kind of a middle Egypt, which is kind of between the two, between Cairo and Luxor. Uh, it's not a term that's really used a whole lot uh, today, uh, but they do kind of, they, they sometimes use that term uh, occasionally to, to do that. Here's other pictures, of course, showing, you know, the Nile River. You can, like I said, notice the drastic drastic difference, you know, between the fertile river and the desert, uh, you know, overall. Um, so you see a lot of date palms and, of course, a lot of, they grow a lot of crops, of course, you know, on both sides of the river, up and down it. Now, going back to ancient times uh, in, in Egypt, Egypt had um, multiple uh, growing seasons. Uh, and uh, these had three, which was all based on the river, uh, in the agricultural seasons uh, that were important. Uh, there are usually only three seasons they had, uh, Peret, Aket, and Shamu. Uh, of course, the one that was the most important one, which you see up there, Aket, uh, is basically what they call the flood season, or what they call, actually, the Egyptians call it the inundation, where the water would uh, quickly rise. Uh, you can see it, it occurred between mid-June to mid-October. It's about the time period. So most around the summertime would be when it is. And, of course, they would use the silt or the mud, that black mud that would come from the, you know, from the river, and they would use that to fertilize their crops. Uh, Perrette's like the growing season or sowing season. 
uh, where they grow crops like wheat, et cetera. Uh, and then you have the harvest season. So you can see the, you can see the Perret was October to February. Then the Shamu was the harvest season from February to June, where they would harvest, you know, various crops uh, in ancient Egypt. Uh, what kind of crops did they grow? Well, they had all kinds of crops, uh, barley, you know, wheat, uh, millet, sorghum. Uh, they used the flax plant, if you know about this, to make linen. Uh, if you know about ancient times at that time, uh, they mostly used linen to, to make their clothes. They didn't have cotton. That's later. Cotton comes really from India later. Uh, date palm, of course. Uh, grapes were there, I believe. Uh, vegetables, different types of vegetables were grown. Uh, you can see fish, birds, crocodile were used for meat, leather. Of course, they talked about papyrus, which is not you know, say like a you know type of plant you can grow, but to eat. But papyrus is, of course, used to make paper, type of hedge plant that, of course, grew uh, in the Nile. So, so yeah, they were able to use a lot of these things. And of course, you know, uh, also another thing about the river too is that the river not just used for irrigation to grow crops, they use it obviously sail up and down the river uh, to, you know, facilitate trade throughout their, their kingdom and later empire uh, as a whole. Now, uh, of course, we're going to move on uh, also, just kind of giving you some background uh, on ancient Egypt, but I am going to move on to kind of talk about the early development of ancient Egypt uh, a long time ago uh, and, um, yeah, Egypt over time is going to unify into two states. Uh, we're going to have this deal where they think Egypt was a collection of city-states at one point. Uh, they kind of merged into two kingdoms. Uh, they do think by maybe before, I'd say before 3200 BC, Egypt had two major kingdoms they had. One that was called the Upper Kingdom, which was in southern Egypt, and they had another one called the Lower Kingdom, which was in the lower part, the lower part of Egypt, like in northern Egypt. So you had these two separate states that you had. And then what happened over time, they believe in the, well, maybe 3150 B.C. or sometime in the 32nd century B.C., the two combined into one empire, uh, which it kind of was. And um, pharaohs, which they, you saw in the video, the term pharaoh uh, meant Great house it was actually a term that originated from the actual palace that the kings, you know, resided in or ruled from. And uh, originally, the different pharaohs, the lower and the upper kingdom pharaohs, had different crowns they wore. Uh, the uh, king of the lower Egypt had a red crown, which was often called Deshret, and then the king of the upper Egypt had a white crown, which was called a Hejet. And so over time, what's going to happen is they're going to merge them together uh, as, as one kingdom or one empire. And that's done by this king named King Menes uh, that we're going to talk about uh, today. Uh, king Menes, of course, um, is believed to be one of the first really famous pharaoh uh, that you hear about in Egypt. They had other pharaohs before that uh, that existed. Uh, I think they knew about some of the kings that were part of the upper kingdom in Egypt. Like I think they have some that are called like the Scorpion King and Ka and a few others that were kind of uh, somewhat known, but not too much known about, about the earlier kings of Egypt. But Menes is important. Uh, Menes was called multiple names. Uh, the Egyptians called him Narmer. So Narmer is the hieroglyphic name they think uh, for King Menes. And then the Greeks, the Greeks either called him Menes or they called him Men. Uh, there's different sources on that. Uh, Herodotus called him Men, either M-I-N or M-E-N. Uh, and then there was this other writer I want to mention. Uh, he's, in fact, these are the, some of the main sources that write about some of these early kings. Uh, Herodotus, of course, is one source uh, that wrote about uh, Men as. Uh, then there's another writer named Manetho, uh, who was an Egyptian writer, uh, historian that was writing during the time of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Uh, he was actually an Egyptian priest. He wrote a series of books that were called The History of Egypt or Egyptica, I think it was the Greek name. It's kind of where the word Egypt comes from in Greek. Uh, and um, 
And it's gone through uh, Flavius Josephus, who was this Jewish Roman historian that's writing about 2,000 years ago uh, in the first century. And um, he's like the source on Manetho because the original historical work, history of Egypt, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and But uh, Manetho called him uh, Menes and Herodotus called him Men. So it's kind of a debate about you know which is correct. But uh, they do know that pretty much all of the, um, you know, um, Kings of kings of Egypt usually had two names: the the hieroglyphic name that the Egyptians used a long time ago, and the ones the Greeks used when they came and took over Egypt after Alexander conquered it. Alexander the Great. Uh, Menes is known for a lot of things. Menes founded the first dynasty of Egypt. There's like something like 31 dynasties of Egypt at one point. Um, it's that one's the so-called part of the so-called pre-dynastic period, which is really like the first two dynasties of Egypt before the old kingdom comes in, which is one of the three major kingdoms uh, that Egypt had that was unified at one point. He also founded their main capital or main administrative capital, uh, which is called Memphis, uh, which the ruins of Memphis are located west of uh, Cairo, kind of west of the Nile. And, um, so yeah, there, there's kind of an image of, of Menes right here. And I think there's kind of different translation of the name Narmer. I've heard all kinds of translations of what of what Narmer meant. I think it meant something like fierce catfish or something like that, because he's got a catfish in his cartouche, or I sometimes call him King Catfish <laughs> or something like that. Uh, but um, so that's kind of like when they think he ruled. Uh, of course, they, the dates on him are kind of, you know, Still not sure exactly uh, when they are, but they think it was somewhere close to about maybe the 32nd or 31st century uh, when men has lived. Uh, there's some other things, too, I wanted to share with you about uh, Narma or Menes. Where's that slide right here? Here's another picture, of course, showing you uh, the two different crowns. Uh, typically, uh, the white crown goes on top of the red crown. Uh, which you can see, so you can see the two. So he, obviously he united uh, the two, uh, you know, kingdoms together to become like one empire. Uh, there's different names for the actual crown. Like the unified crown is sometimes called a shayent uh, in uh, what is, um, I think, Greek. And then I think the Egyptians call it sekemti, uh, is the actual Egyptian hieroglyphic name. So they have their own names for it. And, things like that, but each one had like a symbol. I don't know if you can see that or not uh, with it, but the red crown had a cobra and the white crown had a vulture, kind of like a mascot, you know, for, for each kingdom uh, that they had. Also, um, another thing here, if you go down to, to look at this picture here, uh, Narmer palette, that's something else that's also kind of famous about King Narmer Menes's reign uh, it's well known. And um, they, they found this cosmetic palette uh, in Egypt. I think they found it, I want to say, in 1898. Uh, and it's a palette that they apparently use for either makeup or I think these were makeup or painting statues, they believe. Uh, but it actually depicted, they think, Narmer's uh, reign and how he you know unified Egypt uh, and all that. And so they think it's proof that he was a, a real ruler uh, that reigned that reigned over Egypt uh, at one point. So yeah, they think he was real, you know, uh, King Menes or King Narmer. But it's just that the Greek names kind of you know questionable about which was correct. The Greeks called him or whatever, but it's either Menes or Men uh, that they actually called it. Now the other thing I want to talk about too uh, about Egypt as well. Ancient Egypt is the um, when you study about Egypt, it's divided into different uh, historical periods, especially if you deal with like ancient Egypt. All that. If you look at this, you've got the three major kingdoms that they talked about, of course, uh, in that short video uh, at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, so you got the you know old kingdom, the middle kingdom, and the new kingdom, and you can see the dates there for you know for each one uh, that you've got. Uh, Old Kingdom kind of starts close to about the 26th century B.C. and goes down to about the 22nd century B.C. So you got the Middle Kingdom around the 21st to about the 17th century B.C. 
And then they think the New Kingdom went from the 16th century to the 11th century BC. Uh, there's differences between them a lot. You know, if you study about them, uh, the Old Kingdom on the left uh, is uh, really a, a, is a period where they start building, you know, the pyramids. And they often call it the Age of Pyramids, uh, with the Fourth Dynasty building the most famous ones at Giza, your Cairo. Uh, so, yeah, they're famous for having these rulers that are absolute, uh, that are almost like godlike, which a lot of them are. Uh, Middle Kingdom uh, is kind of a weaker period of, of ancient Egypt and the kingdoms. Uh, during that time, uh, pyramid building stops due to tomb robbing, which was a major problem they had with the pyramids. They're kind of like billboards, you know, these huge structures and easy to rob. Uh, and uh, But they do think that um, the Middle Kingdom uh, did see a thing where uh, the capital began to push more toward the south, uh, and Thebes becomes more important uh, by the time you get to the Middle Kingdom. Now, at the end of the Middle Kingdom, there's a case where they had invaded, you know, about this, uh, by these Semitic people in Asia, southwestern Asia, uh, called the Hyksos that come in. It leads into the Second Intermediate Period, which I'll talk about later. Uh, the New Kingdom, though, on the right there, uh, is more of an empire building period uh, where e Egypt's empire stretches eastward into southwestern Asia and they control like part of where Israel is, Lebanon, and they push up into Syria at one point from our rival state to the Hittites. Uh, it peaks around the time of Ramses the Great, all of that. And uh, the new kingdom is more of a more of a kingdom that was famous for um, empire building, but also uh, temple building. Uh, they built a lot of massive temples, uh, like the Temple of Hatshepsut and a few others. And um, you may have heard of King Tut, uh, 18th Dynasty. Uh, that was considered the most famous dynasty probably in ancient Egypt uh, overall. Uh, in, but yeah, Egypt had other periods that they have. If you look at this um, kind of a timeline of different periods. You can see they had multiple periods that went down even to Roman times uh, at one point. Uh, so you have these so-called intermediate periods that kind of come in like between the kingdoms, first, second, third intermediate periods. Uh, these are periods where Egypt kind of breaks up. It's not really a unified uh, state. Uh, so that, that does occur uh, they do think that Egypt is just does not do as well, you know, in the Iron Age. After the Iron Age comes in, uh, other powers just come in, occupy Egypt, and Egypt is kind of part of other empires, uh, which they were for a long time. You know, Greeks, the Romans, uh, the Persians, the Ottoman Empire, uh, whatever empire you could think of in that area, uh, controlled it, you know, at one point. Uh, so they do have other periods, like the late period, uh, of course, the Ptolemaic Egypt is the one that was founded by, of course, after Alexander the Great conquered, you know, Egypt and the Near East. You do have the Roman, the Roman and Byz Byzantine empires, you know, control it uh, at one point. Those are the main periods of Egypt in ancient times, I guess, before the medieval modern times, of course, uh, which come later. But yeah, Egypt doesn't do well, like in in the you know that 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 late period comes in. All right. Um, now, the other thing you talk about, too, uh, is, you know, religion the mythology, you know, of, of ancient Egypt and, of course, its gods uh, that they have. Uh, the Egyptians had a lot of gods. Uh, they had, I don't know if they had as many as the Mesopotamia did, but they had over 100 gods uh, that they worshipped at one point. And there's a lot of different cult centers that are part of Egypt uh, that are well known. Uh, those are some right there you can see that are that are very famous uh, that have gotten that list right there. So yeah, you got Isis, Osiris, Ra, Horus, Anubis, Set, uh, Amun, Hathor, Toth, Sobek. I'll kind of talk about uh, some of these gods uh, that are there. Uh, some of these gods, as you know, uh, often come in anthropomorphic form. That's one thing that they're kind of known for. Uh, and so in many cases, some look human and some, of course, look like animals or part animals, like a bunch of them do, one, two, three, four, five, like six of them, you can see in there, have kind of like a half, half animal, half, you know, human uh, with it. And um, the Egyptians uh, believed heavily in the afterlife. If you know about the Egyptians, they practice 
a form of mummification where they prepared, you know, their dead uh, for the afterlife. The Egyptians really believed that the uh, human body had to be intact. Otherwise, it wouldn't make its journey through the underworld. And so that's why the Egyptians put so much emphasis on the mummification process, uh, why they built all these massive tombs to, you know, protect the, you know, the their pharaohs, you know, for the afterlife. Uh, and so that's something that they, you know, were, of course, were known for. Uh, of course, we're going to go through, I'll kind of go through and talk about some of the different uh, Egyptian gods that were, of course, were well known, which a lot of these I have in the slide, uh, which you can see there. Yeah, Amen or Amen Ra, you know, uh, is considered to be uh, one of the chief deities, you know, of ancient Egypt, uh, especially by the time of the New Kingdom. Uh, it's a very important god. In fact, Amen was considered to be the state god, part of the state religion of ancient Egypt a long time ago with its cult center at Thebes uh, the, in the uh, Temple of Karnak, as it's called. And um, the name Amen is a um, name that means, in supposedly hieroglyphs, it means the hidden one. You can't see him. Uh, he's all powerful. Uh, and uh, over time, Amen, though, was merged with the god Ra. You know, Ra was, you know, a solar deity of ancient Egypt. Uh, and so the two kind of came became synonymous, but a lot of other gods did too as well, like Osiris, uh, the god Horus, uh, et cetera, the god Anubis. Uh, so they're all kind of seen as variations of the sun god uh, in general. And it's spelled all kinds of ways too. You can see Amun, Amun. Amun, I think, are other ways they sometimes say it because I guess there's nobody around to say how you said it uh, back then in ancient times. But the Greeks kind of saw Amun or Amun Ra as the equivalent to Zeus or like a Jupiter uh, type god. So it's basically the chief god, you know, of, of ancient Egypt a long time ago. Uh, other gods that were important too, uh, they were, you know, big, was Anubis. Uh, Anubis was this jackal-headed god, you can see there, uh, that was often associated with the mummification process. So he's also associated with the dead. Uh, he also was seen as a judge of the dead because uh, Anubis was the one uh, that would judge people's souls uh, in the afterlife or underworld. Uh, there's a thing called the weighing of the heart where they'd weigh your heart against a feather. And Anubis would be one of the ones that would judge you whether you were good or bad. So, yeah, Anubis uh, was often like, I think when priests or whatever would um, embalm or mummify people, uh, they would often wear a jackal mask, uh, which represented uh, the god Anubis. Uh, Horus. Horus is probably considered to be one of the most famous of the different uh, Egyptian gods, uh, predominantly known as the falcon god, of course, the uh, sky god of, of Egypt. Uh, Horus is often seen uh, as the god of kingship because when pharaohs are, I guess, on the throne, uh, they're seen as the living embodiment of the god Horus. And then I guess when basically when a pharaoh would die, he would either become Osiris, like the king of the dead, or I guess in some cases Ham, Amen Ra, uh, or both. I guess all of that same thing, uh, basically. So Horus is often considered very important. Uh, you know, basically a type of God that represents the, the actual Pharaoh. And oftentimes you'll see him with, you know, the, the actual crown on his head. You see the white and red crowns of, of the up, upper and lower lower kingdoms uh, that are merged together. Uh, depends on the mythology, but uh, Horus is often seen as the uh, son of Osiris and Isis, uh, who were like a, a husband and wife. In, in ancient mythology, Isis is kind of similar to Hathor, kind of similar, uh, but uh, Isis uh, was considered like a famous fertility goddess of ancient Egypt. Uh, she's also associated with things like marriage, uh, sex, love, you know, alcohol uh, as well, uh, often seen as the king's mother. Uh, there are other things where I think they say uh, that Ra was married to Hathor, which Hathor is kind of a similar goddess to Isis. They look kind of similar uh, also as well. Uh, that's her on the right, uh, here in that red dress with the cow horns above her head. Uh, I guess similar to a bull, which is like a, kind of like a fertility symbol, I guess, 
you're looking at right there. That's her giving um, paternal life to uh, Nefertari. Queen Nefertari was a famous wife of Ramses the Great, which the Ankh, you know, the Ankh, ancient Egypt was a symbol of eternal life. Uh, there's also um, Osiris. You see there, Osiris. Uh, he, of course, was the husband of Isis, and uh, of course, known as the king of the dead, the god that you know ruled over the underworld. Uh, and um, so she's he's kind of seen as the father of Horus uh, in in Egyptian mythology. Oftentimes, you'll see him as a as a mummy. Because uh, they, they consider him at ancient times to be one of the first Egyptians that was mummified. And uh, there was this famous um, mythological story that's called the story of Osiris that's kind of been around uh, for many years. Uh, and uh, supposedly in the story, um, you know, the story of Osiris, uh, there was this case where Osiris had a brother uh, who I'll show you was named Set. He is right there. And uh, Set wanted to be the king of Egypt. And so if you know the story about this, he had his brother murdered. Uh, and he took his body uh, and put him in a chest and floated him on the Nile. I guess he drowned. Uh, and uh, what happened was um, apparently uh, Isis, which was the wife of Osiris, uh, went and recovered the body. She, she got the body. Uh, and um, I think what happened was, I know the story about this, uh, supposedly uh, Set tried to cut the body up. He stole the body again and cut it up into pieces and took each piece and he buried it around Egypt. And so Isis had to go and actually find all the body parts of Osiris and put him back together. And then she was able to, after that, you know, mummify him. And so after that, you know, Cyrus became, you know, uh, resurrected, you know, as the, the king of the dead. Uh, and so his his son, his son Horus, who I just talked about, you know, a second ago, uh, he had to fight uh, Set, you know, for control, control of Egypt, and he eventually defeated Set. And so Set was banished to the deserts of Egypt, and Horus became the king of Egypt after that. And so that's why all the pharaohs are, like when they're alive anyway on the throne, are often associated with um, Horus. So anyway, it's kind of talking about that story. They consider that story to be one of the oldest mythological stories that talk about ancient Egypt. And it's possible that these may have been real people. Uh, they went back to May before the unification of Egypt, like rule, rulers and stuff like that. Uh, there's Seth, of course, or Seth, you know, one I guess they say it. Uh, he's, of course, this cat god. He looks like a cat god. Uh, he's a god of chaos, desert, uh, infertility, also desert storms as well. Uh, they think he was like this possible king of Egypt a long time ago, maybe. They say theorize maybe where it came from. Uh, but he was like this evil brother of, of Set. But I think oftentimes he's associated with like deserts because he was banished toward it uh, after that. Um, also, uh, another god, two other guys I'll kind of mention too that were famous. Toth, they have also Toth or I think Toth or Toth, how they say it usually, uh, that particular god. Uh, Toth is like a bird god that was famous for like wisdom. Uh, he's often associated with like Egyptian, like science and medicine. And he's also associated with like writing, like hieroglyphs and like the scribes and priests that were associated with hieroglyphic writing a long time ago. Uh, you often see him with a papyrus scroll in his hand. And it's believed like a long time ago that he gave the Egyptians papyrus. Uh, basically, so, so he's often associated with a lot of like the science, science and math and things like that, like all knowledge or wisdom. Uh, so back, of course, they mentioned that video, uh, famous god too of ancient Egypt, so-called crocodile god, uh, often associated with the Nile, especially with crocodiles. Uh, he's often a symbol of like the pharaoh in his power, uh, especially military power. It's also a symbol of male fertility uh, as well. Uh, and you can see he did have a cult center, uh, which is in Thayum, uh, which is in that oasis area I told you about, uh, which is in ancient Egypt. But like I said, the Egyptian, the Egyptians had, you know, numerous gods uh, that they had 
Uh, but the one that was the big one uh, was the cult of Amun. Amun was worshipped at the Temple of Karnak, which, by the way, was the largest temple in the world that was ever built. It's at Thebes, which is now modern Luxor today. So we'll talk about the Temple of Karnak, but it's not later. It's not really later built until the time of the New Kingdom when it becomes really a major cult of interest. Now I'm going to talk about one more thing today, uh, which of course is the subject of uh, what we call uh, mummification, uh, which is something that the Egyptians are heavily known for uh, in ancient Egypt. Um, mummification is just an Arabic name that became popular uh, by modern times. And of course, it's been used in a lot of other cultures uh, to describe similar forms of funerary practices. Like uh, if you study about uh, the ancient I Incas and other cultures in South America, they practice some kind of form of mummification uh, that was kind of similar to this uh, as well. Uh, they sometimes use that term too when they find a dead body in a house, like in a wall. They say, oh, it's been mummified or it's a mummy, or that kind of deal. <laughs> and so hence that name is still used for different things uh, today. Uh, however, the term mummy uh, is from Arabic, uh, mummy or mummification, uh, which actually it's an Arabic name for what they call tar, or tar pitch, or if you want a better modern term to use for us, it would be asphalt, like they use on roads and buildings and things like that. And they think it was part of the embalming process. Uh, when they began to, you know, prepare the dead, uh, et cetera. Uh, so it's like an Arabic name, uh, which the term, the proper name is bitumen, which I think might be the scientific name uh, for, for basically what it looked like. And if you look at this picture here, uh, it was like a type of black substance, uh, like you would see like on red. It's like asphalt, see it at racetracks like NASCAR, something like that. Uh, so you use this kind of material in the actual, you know, mummification uh, process. Uh, there's all kinds of types of pitch that were around. They have this, you know, made of tar, petroleum, and things like that. Uh, they produced some, you know, like pine tar, you know, about that, which they put on, like, wooden baseball bats, uh, kind of similar to that, I guess. Um, but it's, like, really weird uh, about about the Egyptians. The Egyptians, uh, like, at least in modern times, if you study about Egypt, there was a deal where, uh, they would take the outside of mummies and grind it down and make it into like what they call mummy powder, like mummia. Uh, and it was used as a medicine. I think they also used it for paint. Like different kinds of paint uh, were also used uh, as well. But uh, the process of mummification is, is really complicated. Uh, they still exactly don't know everything about probably how it was done. Uh, they do know that um, the process of mummification mostly comes from old sources like, you know, Herodotus, the histories, histories of Herodotus. Uh, he's really the oldest source on how they actually did mummification, which it's got a lot of processes. Uh, I think I'll kind of go through the main processes today about how they did it. Uh, but I think they had as many as 10 different processes that they kind of went, went through uh, to try to preserve, you know, uh, these dead bodies that they would try to, you know, uh, preserve for, for the afterlife. And um, here's kind of an image here, but you can see here uh, from this that it took a long time to do it. It took about 70 days, believe it or not, uh, for the embalming process uh, to, you know, take a corpse and basically preserve it for the afterlife. So they have these workshops that they would actually do, this embalming shops uh, where people would, participate and chief embalmers were obviously involved where they would wear these jack jackal masks which represented Anubis. I told you he was kind of a god of mummification of the dead. Uh, so he's kind of kind of important you know in the process. Uh, and um, according to Herodotus, one of the first things that they would do uh, was they would, they would remove the organs from the body, which the first thing they would do, if you know about this, was they would remove the brain uh, through your sinus cavity. Uh, using some kind of hook thing, which he said it was made of iron, which maybe it was, or maybe it was made of bronze. It's kind of debated about what, what metal they used uh, to actually do it. They supposedly did not keep the brain. They threw the brain away. They would stuff the stuff in the brain, according to Rodinus, like stuff stuff inside the head. 
Uh, also, they took all the organs out too. Uh, the only thing they didn't take out was the heart, which they kept in the body. Well, the heart, I told you, was used as part of a ceremony where they believed that Anubis would, you know, weigh the heart and the afterlife. Uh, so they'd keep that in the body. And then what they would do is they would put the uh, organs in what they call canopic jars, which I do have images of various canopic jars, which usually they had about four of them that they would have. And uh, there were actually these four sons of Horus that supposedly would protect the various organs uh, of the body, which the four are Dhammatef, Kabesadef, Hapi, or Hapi, uh, and M. Seti. And each one would protect certain organs uh, of the body. Dhammatef would protect, you know, the stomach. Uh, Kabesadef was mostly the intestines. Hapi had the lungs, and M. Seti had the liver. And you can see each one had a different head to them. Uh, Dhammatef had a jackal head. Kabesadef had a falcon head. Hapi had a baboon head. And M. Seti looked like a human. So those are all the children of, of the god Horus. But they were supposed to protect the organs uh, in the afterlife. And then what they'd do, the organs, they'd put the organs in with your coffin. Bear it with you. So that's kind of part of the process you know, you're looking at right there. Um, then there's other things that they would do uh, also after that. Uh, according to Aramis, the other thing they would do They'd have to fill the body cavities, which he's got all kinds of theories, you know, about, you know, what what they actually put uh, in the body. Uh, he's got all kinds of theories. Uh, he's, he said they use some kind of tree resin which they put inside the body. He called it pure myrrh. Uh, Casia, which is like a type of cinnamon bark, was may have used uh, perfumes. He claimed that they used uh, some kind of um, like maybe linen sawdust or maybe dry lichen, which is some kind of fungus plant. It would stuff in the body, uh, basically for preservation uh, purposes. Uh, then one of the big things that they would do, which was the most important process they talk about, is the use of natron. Natron was a type of mineral salt uh, that they would get from this desert called Wadi El Natron, which is actually a desert lake that's west of, of the Nile River. Uh, natron and natron was a type of uh, mineral salt uh, that they would cover the whole body in. Uh, it's kind of similar to like baking soda uh, that you'd find in your refrigerator, believe it or not. <laughs> they'd cover your whole body in this for like almost like six weeks. Uh, and so that that process was one of the most important ones because it helped to preserve the body, you know get rid of moisture uh, in general. And then the other thing that they would do, the other thing that's kind of important, obviously, if you look at this, they would then wrap the body uh, with different, um, you know, like linen. They used linen cloth in the flax plant uh, to make bandages. They'd wrap the, wrap the whole body, which that took a while, too, the process uh, as well. Uh, but you can see the process itself took a long time, of course, to do that. Uh, afterwards, they might put a death mask. Uh, on the mummy. Some of them even painted the actual face of the actual dead person uh, on the mummy. I think they do that later in Greek Roman times. They do kind of stuff like that in ancient Egypt. Um, then they think they put some kind of coating on the outside, which some people think was made of different materials, but they do think they poured mummia or the tar pitch was poured over the coffin. And sometimes it was poured over the sarcophagus uh, as well. So the process was pretty lengthy. Uh, it took, like I said, 70 days uh, to do this. And they have found thousands of mummies. They keep finding, you know, different tombs, burial chambers uh, all over uh, ancient Egypt. Uh, and so that's something that's kind of, you know, still going on today, uh, a long time ago, in even modern times uh, overall. So anyway, kind of, kind of talking about, you know, ancient Egypt. I know that the most famous mummy uh, that they ever found, which of course, I won't be talking about that one today, uh, but the most famous one uh, they ever found, you know, was was obviously King Tut uh, and his mummy uh, that was later found, of course, in the early 20th century. We'll talk about King Tut later, probably next week, uh, more or less. But, but anyway, um, that's it for my lecture part one, of course, on ancient Egypt. Now, of course, later in the week on Friday, I'll have a part two lecture I'll kind of go into 
uh, when I discuss the period of the old kingdom. I'm going to kind of go into the you know, age of pyramids. We'll talk about the building of the pyramids behind me. I'll talk about the Great Sphinx. The Sphinx, you know, you see there, uh, that's kind of almost like my head's in the Sphinx, I guess, right there a little bit. But I'll talk about the Sphinx uh, and the different kinds of tombs that they built, you know, in ancient Egypt. I should have time to kind of talk about hieroglyphic writing because I'll kind of get into and talk about the importance of the discovery of the Rosetta Stone uh, that was found in ancient Egypt, uh, which kind of really gives us a lot of information about Egypt a long time ago. Uh, so before I go, though, uh, in this lecture, don't forget uh, y'all had, y'all got various assignments that are out now. I know you got the prehistory uh, quiz uh, that's still up uh, for y'all to kind of wrap up on. That's something you'll need to kind of, you know, finish up uh, and get that done. And then, of course, the, the big ones I put up now, you know, uh, that are due next week are going to be uh, Ancient Mesopotamia, you know, Canvas Quiz number two. And, of course, the vocab will be due Monday, of course, next week. So I'll try to remind you, you know, throughout the week and weekend, uh, of course, uh, coming up. So that's it for today. Uh, yeah, we're pretty much, I have my lectures Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, except for maybe if there's a reason why I don't. I'll kind of tell you, uh, but using my lectures are pretty much three days a week because, uh, of course, we're a seven seven weeks class, so that's that's why we're kind of doing it three days a week uh, in all that. But there may be some times where I might have a recorded lecture on several live ones. So that's it for today. Uh, if you have, you know, like I said, a comment question, you know, uh, about this lecture, let me know. Of course, on my YouTube channel, uh, anytime. Uh, I'll try to get it answered. Or uh, if you got a comment question about you know, the class, you know, please let me know. Uh, you know, you'd be an email. I think everybody's pretty much got my email about what that is. Uh, so I'll see y'all later in the week. Uh, and I'll send out announcements, of course, about the upcoming lecture I've got, uh, that part two lecture, of course, on ancient Egypt. So y'all take care and have a great, great rest of the week.